something out in the cow fields down in Louisiana. Uh, but I'm becoming one <coughs> in Sun City. Sun City has seven courses, and I live right across from the golf course. But uh, I got to know Kermit from his book mainly. And then he was at the seminar in Atlanta a couple times, I think, and spoke. And the things that I can remember, of course, a professional golfer, Bob Hope named him, what was the title Bob Hope gave you? Something? Pro from the Moon. Pro from the Moon. Where did you get that name? Zarley. Pro from the Moon. And I know Kermit and a friend started the PGA Bible study group that's still in existence. So that's, that's pretty good. And then through my buddy James Wright over in uh, West Phoenix, I got to know him a little bit better. We used to meet at the house and have Bible studies, but especially the book. If you haven't seen Kermit's book, it's fantastic. The Restitution of Jesus Christ. It's one of the best things I've ever seen. And, of course, he covers yod heh vav -Hey quite a bit, but also just how we lost Jesus and how we can find him again. So let's give Kermit a hand, and he'll have an hour, too. Thank you. Well, maybe I should just uh, give you a little update on what's going on with me before I get into something here that I was thinking about talking about. Uh, I've given my testimony here before and talked about how I came to my uh, transition like Bill and Stephanie did, uh, being a Trinitarian Christian for 22 years, uh, playing out on the PGA Tour and uh, starting uh, Christian, co-founding Christian ministry out there. And then after uh, 22 years of uh, being a Trinitarian Christian, uh, being confronted with this idea that no, the Bible doesn't say Jesus is God. And just to brush you up on this, if you haven't heard me say this here in the church, it happened in the winter of 1979 and 80. Uh, <clears throat> I was in my study, and I was reading Jesus Olivet Discourse, uh, which I knew pretty well, because I had emphasized in my uh, biblical, in my study of the Bible, uh, which I, became, I first became a serious student of the Bible when I was 18 years old, my first year in college. And uh, I had emphasized Bible prophecy. Uh, the reason for that was that <clears throat> in my first year in college at the University of Houston, I was born in Seattle, went to college on a golf scholarship, all the way down to Houston, and started to get involved with Campus Crusade for Christ, uh, was attending a Bible church that was very focused on studying the Bible, and I was invited to a retreat uh, held by Campus Crusade for Christ near Austin, Texas, uh, out on a ranch. And the two uh, keynote speakers were the pastor of this church that I was now attending. Uh, the church uh, name was Baraka. It was an independent Bible church. And uh, the other speaker was Hal Lindsey, who had attended the University of Houston like I was at the time. He actually uh, uh, didn't even graduate. <laughs> And uh, the pastor, Bob Thiem, talked him into trying to attend Dallas Theological Seminary, which he got into the seminary. Hal's about five or six years older than I am. And then uh, he graduated, went on Campus Crusade for Christ staff. And, uh, and so then he, he, co he wrote a book with the help of uh, another person uh, the late great uh, planet Earth, and so I didn't e I didn't even know about the book probably the first year that he wrote it, uh, but eventually that book sold so many millions of copies, uh, 
largely because he was a traveling speaker for a crusade on college campuses. And so the book sold about 35 to 40 million copies in the first 10 years, and Time Magazine um, uh, identified it as the book of the decade, which they do at the end of every decade. And so that was really an astonishing thing that a book on Bible prophecy had even sold over a million copies. That had never happened. And yet, Lindsay's book was selling tens of millions of copies. And so, <clears throat> it was Hal who, uh, who whetted my appetite to get interested in the Bible, and especially in Bible prophecy. Uh, <clears throat> so, here I am in 1979, about in December, studying in my study, and I'm reading Jesus' Olivet Discourse, and Jesus says concerning his second, his yet to come, second coming, uh, no one knows the day or the hour. Uh, neither the Son of Man, speaking of himself, nor the angels of heaven, but only the Father. And so I knew that saying of Jesus pretty well, but all of a sudden a light went on. And I thought, Jesus is saying that he doesn't know the time of his second coming. And yet, he's not just man, he's God. God knows everything. And besides that, he said it right there, the Father knows. And so if Jesus is co-equal with God the Father in every way, then Jesus has to know when his second coming is going to happen. Now, I had also been taught the doctrine of the hypostatic union of Christ. And so what that means is Jesus has two natures, a divine nature, a human nature. And so I'd been taught that Jesus said and did things uh, that are recorded in the New Testament Gospels and we need to understand that sometimes he did or said those things only from the perspective of his human nature or from his divine nature. And in this case, I've been taught, he said that in his human nature. But he certainly did know the time of his second coming because he has a divine nature and he knows it in his divine nature. And I said, wait just a minute. This makes Jesus look like a liar, if not schizophrenic. That's the thought I had immediately. And I said, wow, I must look into this. Sometimes I talk to myself when I'm in my study. <laughs> and I'm liable to blurt something out, and that's what I did. I must look into this. Well, that was an understatement. For the next 28 years, I estimate that I read about a thousand books on the identity of Jesus. And so I'd go to libraries, and of course I was out playing the PGA Tour, and I would sometimes go to libraries, wherever I was, theological libraries, went to Harvard's, went to lots of them. But at home, I would use the interlibrary loan system all the time. And what you do is you go to your local library, if you haven't ever done this, and you find out about a book, and they don't have it in their system, but they can order it, because all the libraries are connected. The government did this a long time ago. And so you can get a book, no matter where it is, you just need to order it at your local library, and then it might take two or three weeks. It'll show up. They will inform you. You go to your library, get the book. Just think about that. I did that hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. And when I would go to the, the libraries, the theological libraries, I would be investigating all of these critical texts 
that Trinitarians cite to support their view, critical texts of the Bible. Um, and so I was trying to find out what do all of these commentaries say about this, like John 1.1c, and the word was God. And then we find in verse 14 that the author is speaking about Jesus, who came in the flesh. Um, and so all of these verses, John 20, 28, uh, Thomas said to Jesus, my Lord and my God. Those are the two main texts in the Bible that Trinitarian scholars cite to support their view that Jesus is God. And so I'm learning all about this through the years, and I, I uh, had already decided uh, that I was going to try to become a Christian author. I wasn't sure what I was going to do when I finished the PGA Tour, and that did actually come to an end uh, in night after 1982. And it was in the summer of 1982 I was playing in the U.S. Open at Pebble Beach, my favorite golf course, my favorite tournament, and I actually 10 years later, we'd had the 72 Open there, and I had a chance to win it. I was leading in the last round, and Jack Nicklaus was right behind me, and so he overtook me, and I took the gas and blew the tournament and finished sixth. But here I am 10 years later, and I'm just so thrilled to be playing in the same tournament again. My main goal in, in my life as a professional golfer was to win the U.S. Open. And so that's the closest I ever came in 72. But here I'm thinking, I got another chance. Well, I was, I was playing good golf uh, in the tournament the first um, three rounds. And uh, I don't know if I would, would say I had a chance to win the last round, but uh, I don't think I can say that. But I was staying in a Christian home, in a private home, which I didn't do very much. You know, I always stay in hotels. Uh, but somebody had set this up for me. And it just so happened these people had a theological library. So here I am, you know, I'm in the midst of the study while I'm playing golf even out on the tour. And so I'm coming back to the uh, place where I, I'm staying after I play my round in the tournament. And I'm getting in this library and I'm reading all these theological books. I'm still into this, this subject. And it was actually, I should have gone to sleep like at, at 11 o'clock, no later. And here I am at 3 o'clock in the morning. And I'm earnestly praying to God about this because it's kind of a scary thing. You know, I knew what I was getting myself into. I knew that if I gave up the doctrine of the Trinity, all of my Christian friends are just going to depart from me. And, uh, and so, you know, but I'm, I'm like Bill was uh, sharing with us. I care about the truth. I want to believe who Jesus really is. I want to believe who God really is. If the church fathers have been wrong about this, when they devise this doctrine of the Trinity and that Jesus is co-equal with God the Father, if they're wrong about it, I want to know it. And so I'm willing to, you know, go through persecution, which I certainly did in the following years. All kinds of my friends, you know, left me. And so, but here I am, and I'm praying about it so earnestly, and I, I came to the conviction that, no, the Bible does not say Jesus is God. But there were two verses that hung me up. Je you know, the first thing I, I did when I told you that in 1975 I had this enlightenment, about Jesus Olivet Discourse. I said, okay, if I'm going to get serious about this, how should I uh, undertake this study? And I said, all right, the first and most important thing is 
Who did Jesus say he was? And so we've got all these sayings of Jesus in the New Testament four Gospels. And the easiest way to see what he said, go get a red letter Bible. So that's immediately what I did. Went to my Christian bookstore, bought a red letter Bible, read through all the, the sayings of Jesus, which are in red, not one single thing where Jesus says, I'm God or anything close to it. I already knew about his saying in John uh, 10, 30, I and the Father are one. But I wasn't, you know, maybe I, I thought that supported his being equal with God up until that point, but at least then, I decided, hmm, you know, I actually said to myself, if that's all they've got, referring to Trinitarians, this doesn't look very good for that position. And so, <clears throat> so this, you know, threw me into this study. Uh, but I still, two verses hung me up. I said, okay, Jesus doesn't say he's God. There isn't anything really that, that just totally says this, and certainly, there, you know, there's eight passages in the New Testament where God or the Father, Jesus or the Son, and the Spirit or the Holy Spirit are brought together and mentioned together. But that doesn't support the doctrine of the Trinity. It doesn't say that Jesus is three persons. It doesn't say that any place in the Bible. The word Trinity is not in the Bible. And so, you know, this goes on and on. And so I'm becoming more and more convinced. But there's these two passages that I regarded as barriers. And that was John 1.1c, and the Word was God, and Thomas's confession. Uh, my Lord, my God. He's calling Jesus my Lord and my God. At least that's what I thought, and that's what everybody says. It took me five years before I believe I saw the light about what those texts mean. And so I don't think that the traditional English translation in John 1.1c is correct. Uh, I think the New English Bible does it very well. Um, what God was, the Word was. Uh, there's one other translation that does similarly. Uh, but on Thomas' confession, this is where I think I, I uh, I've done the, the best work in my book, which I eventually wrote, and that was published in 2008, which Joe mentioned, The Restitution of Jesus Christ. And uh, in that, in John 20, 28, I explain that I think that this uh, indicates that Thomas now realized what Jesus had just taught him and Philip recorded in John 14, when uh, Philip said, let's see, was it Thomas or Philip? Just show us the Father. You know, Jesus is, starts out, this is at the Last Supper, and Jesus starts out, and he says, uh, in my Father's house are many rooms. I go there to prepare a place for you. And so he's indicating that he's going to leave this earth and he's going to go to heaven. Uh, and so then he eventually says in verse 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. And so then enters uh, Thomas and Philip in a discussion with Jesus. And uh, so how does Jesus respond? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Now that doesn't mean that Jesus is saying that he's the Father. A lot of Christians, even Trinitarians, they're not very well taught, uh, think that's what it means. 
No. Their Trinitarian teachers will tell them, no, Jesus is not claiming to be the Father. However, <clears throat> uh, and so I believe that, um, that when Thomas said that in 2028, this is an indication that is now dawned on him. He has seen the risen Jesus. You know, he told his disciples, when his colleagues, when they saw it, the risen Jesus on Easter evening, and he wasn't present, that they've seen the Lord. He's alive. He says, I won't believe it unless I can put my finger through the holes in his hands and the hand through the, the hole in his side from the spear. And so we call him Doubting Thomas. But one week later, they're gathered together, probably in the upper room, and Jesus appears again, the risen Jesus, uh, and he says to him, Thomas, put your finger here, and so forth. And so that's when Thomas uh, exclaims this uh, uh, tremendous saying. And so what he means is he realizes that God is in Jesus, just like Jesus had taught. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Doesn't mean he is the Father, doesn't mean he is God. He means the Father dwells in me. And so this is uh, how Jesus is the great revelation of God, unlike anything God had ever done before or since. He has entered into Jesus, and so this is why we call him the Son of God, like Bill mentioned about Son of God, appears in the Bible and other places, identifies angels as sons of God. Uh, how about Job 1 and Job 6, when uh, the council of God meets, and there's angels there, and they're called sons of God. In different places, human beings are called sons of God. Israel is called sons of God. But Jesus is the Son of God. He's unique in this way. God has never indwelt anybody like this. And so Jesus can say, uh, my words are the Father's words. He speaks the words of God, unlike anybody ever. And so this is the great revelation of God, Jesus Christ. God dwells in him. God lives in him. And so Jesus comes to reveal God, but that's not all of his mission. His mission is to go to the cross. And so God sent the man Jesus to die for us on the cross so that God, uh, he bears our sins. And if we will just believe in him as our sin bearer, that's what makes us a Christian. Nothing about believing Jesus is God. No, 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 no. I came to Jesus when I was 13 years old. My Sunday school teacher led me privately in a prayer. And I accepted Jesus into my heart uh, as my Lord and Savior. Amen. That's what makes a person a Christian. I'm not saying you have to have, pray with somebody and do that. It's a faith response to believe in Jesus as your Lord and your Savior. And Lord means you try to make him the master of your life. You learn what he teaches, try to obey what he says, and you go on and live your life like this. But to believe in him as your savior and then accept him as your Lord, that's the two things right there. If we go and look at evangelistic texts, uh, Bill, you mentioned one. Yeah, Acts 2. And then, um, Joel, you mentioned John 20, 31. Tremendous text. We could go to others like, Romans uh, 10, verse 9 and 10, or um, 1 uh, Corinthians 15. You know, Christ died according to the scriptures, uh, buried, raised from the dead the third day according to the scriptures. Uh, and so this is what the Christian message, the biblical Christian message is about. It's about Jesus being the sin bearer on the cross. God raising him from the dead, proving that he was, and then following Jesus in our life. That's what makes a Christian. Doesn't have anything to do with the doctrine of the Trinity. 
Nothing to do with, you know, is Jesus God or not? Doesn't have anything to do with that. And so what an enlightenment, you know, to spend these years thinking Jesus is God and believing in the doctrine of the Trinity and then finding out, you know, the church fathers, here's what happened. Some of them started to think that Jesus was God in the second century. We don't have any evidence of this in the first century, only in the second century, uh, starting with Ignatius and his seven letters, and, uh, which were probably authored in maybe 110 um, AD, something like that. Uh, but they began to think that Jesus was God, but they did not think he was God absolutely. Um, they used, you know, they lived in the Roman Empire. The G Roman Empire was, uh, was Hellenistic. That refers to the Greek Empire that was prior to the Roman Empire. And so there was this Hellenistic culture, uh, Hellenistic philosophy that still pervaded. And so their concepts and language, you know, they, they, Greek was like English, you know, it's kind of a universal language. Latin was just over there in the West, uh, where the Ro uh, Rome was. Um, but they, uh, they had this, these Hellenistic concepts. And so that's, they would use this term absolutely. And so they, they believe that the Father is absolutely God. But the godness of Jesus, the divinity of Jesus, or whatever you want to call it, it was derived, derived from the Father. So that's a, you know, I call that big God, little God. And so that's what the, uh, the church fathers, they're called apologists, who wrote, and we can read their writings now, uh, that's what they believed in the second century, in the third century. They believed in this big God, little God. They did not believe that Jesus was equal in his divinity to God, to God the Father. They didn't believe that. And so when Arius came along in the early part of the fourth century, he was a presbyter in Alexandria, Egypt. And uh, he started teaching these things about uh, the logos, the word. They were very centered. The, the Christianity in the, in the first centuries uh, got to be very centered on logos concept. Uh, and that's what we read about in the first chapter of John, the word. Um, and so they... Uh, <clears throat> they were understanding uh, the Logos as, uh, you know, it's the, the divinity of the Logos is derivative. And so then, that's what Arius was saying, and then he said, uh, the Logos is not eternal. There was a time when the Logos came into existence. Uh, his um, bishop didn't like that. <laughs> and so that was Bishop Alexander, the bishop of the Alexandrian diocese, you know, the city of Alexandria. Uh, uh, what did I say? No, um, Athanasius. Alexander died. Uh, when did he die? He died in about, okay, the Nicene Council was in the summer of 325. Arius had been preaching this stuff for a few years, and it was permeating the empire, and the emperor became very alarmed about that. That's Constantine. Uh, he was a professing Christian. His mother seemed to be devout Christian. And uh, so Arius is stirring things up. And so the emperor calls this council. It's the first 
the Catholic Church calls it the first ecumenical council. Uh, I mean, really, the book of Acts says the first council of the Christians <laughs> was uh, before that. But at any rate, so they hold this council. And yes, Athanasius attends the council. But Athanasius can't speak at the council. Neither can Arius, because neither one of them are bishops. According to the, uh, history, there were 318 bishops who attended this council. And it's only the bishops who could speak before the gathering. And so what happened was uh, Alexander died about a year or two later. And Athanasius uh, inherits his bishopric. And so Athanasius becomes the great defender of the Nicene Creed. So the council produced this creed, and that's what the emperor had been pressuring the council to do. <laughs> he wanted them to come to a decision about who this Jesus is, is he eternal or not, and so they produced a creed. Now there were three people there who refused to sign. Uh, meaning to accept the creed. And that was two bishops and uh, Arius. And they were expelled from the empire. But <laughs> the emperor went and kicked off here about two years later. He died. And so uh, who was the emperor that succeeded him? I forget uh, his name. Yeah, I think it was. I think it was Constantine too. And so, uh, now I could be getting a little mixed up here, but uh, either Constantine II or Constantine I before he died, he had a sister who was Arian, and she convinced him of Arius' position. And so, even though the emperor had accepted the creed, now he wasn't so sure. And so what happened is there's all this going back and forth in the empire for decades following about whether or not the Nicene Creed is exactly true. And what does it say? Jesus is very God of very God. And that in itself is, has Hellenistic concept in it. And, uh, and so, you know, it's all about is Jesus an eternal being? Because Arius said, no, the Logos is not eternal. And there was a time when the Logos was created, and yes, the Logos did become Jesus. Arius taught that. Uh, but the preexistence of Jesus, it being the Logos, no, there was a time when the Logos, and therefore Jesus, did not preexist. So Arius taught that Jesus preexisted as the Logos, but he taught that it, it wasn't eternal in the past. And this is what the argument was all about. You know, and secular historians, they look at this like Gibbons. You guys are nuts. And so, yeah, I believe that the church fathers went astray uh, when that happened. Now, they didn't deal with the Holy Spirit. And so there was no doctrine in the Trinity. This is another thing Christians get mixed up about. Trinitarians, uh, sometimes, they think, oh, the doctrine of the Trinity. That happened back there at the Nicene Council. No, it didn't. And for the decades afterwards, there was nothing about that until uh, the three Cappadocians in the uh, 60s and 70s began writing essays and treatises and so forth about the Holy Spirit, and they eventually come to this idea that God is three persons. They're all co-equal. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And so that's what is the official doctrine of the Trinity that became official, according to, by the church, 
in the second ecumenical council, which was in 381, and, uh, but it's interesting, they, they uh, added to the Nicene Creed so that it's called the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed. And yet, and they're explaining in there about the equality, but they don't use the word Trinity. And why is that? Because there have been all these decades, uh, or all this time previously, in which they had dealt with uh, using language that isn't in the Bible. And the average Christian would look at that. And of course, you know, the, what is the Bible? And when did it get accepted? Well, that was happening in the fourth century too. But those documents existed all that time. The church had respect for these documents. They used them in their worship and everything. So there was a recognition of divine inspiration of the documents that we have in the New Testament. But, you know, it took some time for them to bring the Old Testament and the New Testament together. And it was going on then in the fourth century. Um, but no trinity in these documents. And so this is why I think they didn't use the trinity. But um, anyway, I've kind of uh, gone afield here. In fact, I came here to give you a message about Jesus as the son of man. <laughs> uh, the reason for that is in the past few decades, my favorite study in the Bible is Jesus as the son of man. And, uh, you know, that is a recognition that Jesus is a man. And that's what we believe. Um, Jesus is not God. He's a man. He was a man like us. Uh, a human being. I mean, we got ladies here. Jesus was a human being like us, except for one thing. He came into this world similar to how Adam came into this world. God made Adam from the dust of the ground, breathed into him life, and Adam became a human being. But Adam didn't have a nature to sin. And so it was only at the garden of, uh, in which he, he sinned. Sin came into the human race. But Jesus was born of a virgin. And so he doesn't inherit a sin nature. And I believe that uh, Jesus gets his ideas about the kingdom of God, which he preached all the time, especially in parables, and his identification as a son of man, uh, in my harmony of the gospels, he uh, refers to the son of man 38 times. If you look at all four gospels together, it's 82 times. And he never called himself the Christ, the Messiah, publicly. And why is that? Scholars are right. There's a messianic secret there. God is, has a certain time when he wants Jesus to die on the cross. It's going to be during Passover. That's symbolism there. Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And so <clears throat> God is orchestrating the life of Jesus. And he's not having him preach about him being the Christ. But when it comes to saying son of man, you know, the Jews had this concept of the Messiah, the Christ. Why, he's the king of Israel. And they would have these messianic uprisings because they were under the subjugation of the Roman Empire. They weren't allowed to be a part of the Roman Empire because they believed in one God and the Romans had all kinds of gods. And so, but they were under the subjugation. They didn't like it. So once in a while, Somebody would say, I'm the Messiah. They'd rise up. The Romans would have to put them down with their soldiers. And, uh, and so if Jesus would have been 
admitting publicly to being the, uh, the Messiah, the, the King of Israel, as Nathaniel said there that, uh, that Bill uh, read to us, uh, that would have been alarming to the Roman authorities. And so Jesus understands this. But what about son of man? No, the Jews don't really have much of a concept of son of man. Uh, you know, we could look at first Enoch, the parables, and yeah, that's great, some, I think, good commentary there on especially son of man. But um, that's not uh, an alarming identification. Um, so anyway, Jesus gets his I his idea of the kingdom of God and him as a son of man, uh, primarily from Daniel 7, which is what I was going to talk to you about, but we'll close it right there. Anybody have any questions? PGA Tour with? Babe Hiskey. Babe Hiskey. Yeah, I remember the story. Yeah, Babe and I were roommates in college, best friends. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Babe's brother, Jim Hiskey, five years older than Babe. Babe's two years older than me. Jim and Babe were from Idaho. They went to Houston on a golf scholarship. And I uh, came after that uh, from Washington State. Uh, Jim went on the, uh, Jim was an All-American uh, golfer, college golfer, three years. Uh, one that he helped his team win the NC2A team championship once. Uh, I did that once. Uh, Jim went on the PGA Tour one year. And then he decided, this is not for me. Uh, Jim and Babe had, were nominal Mormons. And Bill Bright, the founder of Campus Crusade for Christ, sent two guys out to Houston. Uh, Bill was over there next to the UCLA campus, started this, this ministry among college students. And so he sent two of his his guys, one of them been an All-American football player, college, and uh, they, they got in our dorm down in the basement. This is before I came, two years before I came to school. And they're just sharing the gospel and inviting athletes. A revival took place among the athletes there at school. So when I came there, uh, here were these uh, guys meeting in an athletic dorm for Bible study and prayer, and I just joined in because it was a revival of my um, Christian faith, you know, uh, going back to when I was 13 years old. And so anyway, Jim went on crusade staff, and uh, he imparted to me and Babe, who were now on the PGA Tour, uh, why don't you guys try to start a Bible study out there? And this is something that hadn't been happening in sports, the only th in pro sports. The only thing that had happened was that Bobby Richardson had come out. He was a, uh, he played for the New York uh, Yankees baseball team. And he came out publicly as a devout Christian. And this kind of started a movement a little bit in pro baseball. But our sport was second. And so we, we established something different. They were having chapel services. Uh, and we didn't do that. We, had, uh, uh, we wanted to bring the families, the wives and everybody. And so we'd do this at, uh, at night on Tuesday night at the tournaments. Uh, you know, get a hotel room or somebody's house or rent a room at a hotel. And uh, so this is how we started the PGA Tour Bible study. You started, started with your best friend or, or good friend. Yeah. After you came to the conclusion that God is one and that Jesus is his son, did you not 
then get barred from the very organization that you helped found? I did. Uh, I don't talk about it much. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, I went to my friend Jim in that summer of 82 and uh, told him what I was thinking. And he was alarmed. Uh, by this time, Jim uh, had been with Crusade staff seven years. Uh, there was an exodus from Crusade of some of their best guys. It was about seven, seven people. Jim was one of them. And Jim went to Washington, D.C. and hooked up with Dick Halverson, who became the chaplain of the U.S. Senate, and Doug Coe. Uh, a man had started a ministry that in the beginning was called International Christian Leadership. Uh, he did this with President Eisenhower when, when Ike was still president, and they started a presidential prayer breakfast, which is now called the National Prayer Breakfast. Uh, but they had a whole bunch of different ministries, and so that's who Jim was with. Uh, at the time, in 1982, I went to Jim, talked to him about this. He said, would you go see some people that I would choose? I said, yeah, talk about it. So uh, he chose R.C. Sproul. I spent a whole day with R.C. Uh, in his house. My fam I brought my family. He had a, a place there for you know all the people to come for his conferences. Uh, then, uh, uh, what's his name that was the president of Westminster at the time and then the president of Regent up in BC. So I talked to all three of them. They gave Jim a clean bill of health. But you see, at the time, I'm, I'm not very, uh, you know, I don't know that well about what I'm believing. I'm swimming around here and trying to understand this. So to be able to express what I'm talking about, you know, I may not be very good about it. Uh, but anyway, that's what happened. But in the ensuing years, uh, eventually, uh, oh, I'm keeping this to myself. That's another thing. You know, I've been criticized by that, by, in the biblical Unitarian movement. But no, I, I still believe I did the right thing. Uh, I, my feet were not totally planted on the ground because I told you I had two verses that were barriers but another thing I didn't tell you was it took me 12 years to give up the pre-existence and so <clears throat> you know this is through study and study and study I'm reading you know all of the experts and uh, so, you know, my book, I, I cite over 400 scholars. Uh, and so uh, it took me a while to do that. But uh, some of my closest friends knew about it. And those people eventually were leaving me. Uh, you know, sometimes I would talk to them about it. But for the most part, I was keeping it to myself. And I... The reason was I wanted to get something down on paper that I was absolutely sure about, and then they could read it, and that was going to be a book. And so I didn't come out publicly until I published my book in 2008. Um, so yeah, you're right, Joe. Did you have something? defend the term evangelical. You know, I grew up in the Southern Baptist Church, and I like the term evangelical. Now that I've come to understand the good news of the kingdom of God, I think we are evangelical. And you're kind of saying, we need to steal that term back from those kind of radical orthodox people. What do you think about that? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> something has just happened and I can't talk about it. Um, it could be kind of big. Um, I, I have a blog, Kermit Zarley blog, 
on Pathius.com, which claims to be the biggest conversation on faith on the internet. Uh, I've had the blog since 2013. Every once in a while I write a blog post about my uh, profession to be an evangelical. I was an evangelical before I changed on this, but I believe I'm still an evangelical because what are the main principles of evangelicalism? Well, we got a, a, a man who has, who has identified what evangelicals are. Uh, I won't get into this, but um, they refer to him all the time. And what is an evangelical? Bible-centered, cross-centered, uh, activism, uh, I forget the third one. No God, Jesus God in it. No doctrine of the Trinity. Uh, pretty surprising. Um, and so, but, but yeah, I still claim to be an evangelical. Uh, I get pushback about it all the time. Uh, I don't know, I don't like what's happening to evangelicalism, getting so uh, centered on politics here in the U.S. In fact, my next book is coming out probably next week. Uh, you know, I'm doing a series. I'm still here, and I'm going on too long here. I'm doing a series on biblical eschatology. It's called Still Here. That's in reaction to the fiction series, Left Behind. And so I changed in 1971 uh, after for 12 years being a dispensationalist Christian and therefore a pre-tribulationist. That means, pre-tribulationism means Jesus' second coming is in two parts. The first stage, he comes before the tribulation, and they say the tribulation lasts seven years, and then he comes uh, a second time, and this time down to the earth. He comes the first time only into the air. The, the saints rise up, resurrected. He takes them all to heaven, and then at the end of the tribulation, uh, they all come down to the earth. That's pre-tribulationism. I studied the subject in 70, 71, and changed my belief, and I've been what's called a historic or classical uh, premillennialist ever since. And that's a person who believes uh, Jesus' second coming is literally going to happen, and then the book of Revelation says, uh, mentioned six times in chapter 20 about a millennium. And uh, that's where this concept of millennialism comes from. And so Jesus' kingdom on the earth will last for a millennium, and then we won't get into what happens after that. Um, but, uh, and so I was a premillennialist and changed uh, at that time. Uh, and so I, uh, I mean I was a dispensationalist premillennialist. So now I'm a historic premillennialist. Pre <laughs> and, uh, and so I was trying to write on eschatology and I didn't know where I was going with this and I was praying about it a lot. And uh, well, actually my best friend in the last 30 years is a professor in Chicago, Scott McKnight. And so in uh, the year 2000, uh, Scott says, why don't you uh, join the Society of Biblical Literature and come with me to the annual meeting. Uh, so I did that. And uh, we also had uh, started a, um, a uh, Kerman's Arley Lectures at his school at the time, he's not there now, North Park University in Chicago. And uh, we were having each year a, a keynote speaker. So the first year we had his PhD supervisor, Jimmy Dunn, James uh, D.G. Dunn. 
And, uh, you know, one of the two uh, top New Testament scholars in the world in the last part of the 20th century, him and Tom Wright. Uh, and Jimmy was regarded as number one on Christology because of his book, uh, Christology in the Making. So, Jimmy was our speaker at the first Kerman Zarley Lectures, and we held it right before the annual meeting of the Society of Biblical Literature, which Joe, you and I uh, met at one of the annual meetings one year. We heard Larry Hurtado. <laughs> but anyway, so uh, Jimmy roomed with me and Scott. And uh, I asked Jimmy, um, I said, Jimmy, what are the verses that you're absolutely sure of that Jesus is God? He says there's one. That right there shocked me. <laughs> John 1.14 compared to John 1.1. 1, 1. But he eventually wrote a book at the end of his life about worship of Jesus, which Anthony Buzzer and a lot of people thought he'd abandoned uh, the deity of Christ. But I don't think so. I think it's a misunderstanding. But Jimmy, Jimmy just died. I'll end it right there, folks. That's fantastic hearing. Uh, yeah, at the SBL with Larry Hurtado, someone asked him, did Jesus ever think he was God? And he used an expletive, H-E-L-L, -L, no. I mean, he shouted this out. He so sure Hurtado and Dunn are, are the big guns in the... Uh, the world. And we lost James Dunn, Larry Hurtado, and Hans Kuhn this year. And I'm going to quote Hans Kuhn a little bit, the, the Catholic scholar. Oh. Okay, the ladies have lunch ready. Please stay for lunch. She's, we've got plenty. This was fantastic. Kermit, one of your best presentations I've ever heard. This Thank is fantastic. You, we'll have it on tape. The whole world can look at it. Lord willing. <laughs> Let's pray for food. Father God, <laughs> Yahweh El Shaddai, God Almighty, El El Yan, God Most High, we just thank you for this day. We thank you first for the gift of your son that you gave to us, that you allowed him to have our sins laid on him. And so, Father, we thank you for this time for Bill and Stephanie to be here and, and tell us how they came to know your true Messiah and how you have made him both Lord and Messiah. And so, Father, we thank you for Kermit and all his years of study, and we pray a blessing on that. And we thank you for this day, this time, and this place, for everyone here or online. And, Father, bless this food that we're about to partake and the hands that have prepared it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right.